Hey everyone, it's Ben here, and I'm in a new place right now. Um, just starting my just started my MBA program, and uh, so I'm doing the Amazon stream today, and I. I'm wearing glasses because they're like blue light protection glasses and I'm going to be like modeling and straining my eyes a bit. But anyway, um, the agenda for today is first I'm going to be going over some disclaimers and notes and then I'm going to go through a brief Amazon situation overview, talk about Wall Street Prep who is our sponsor for today's stream and lastly go through the um, high level street based DCF which a lot of you guys may be familiar with. and. Um, Unfortunately, because I'm streaming at a very like odd time during the day, I can't, I'm not like streaming streaming where you guys can join in, but I'll try to do that in the future. It's just with school these days, my schedule is so random that it's been really hard to stream in the, the time that I want to in the mornings. So um, in, yeah, that's uh, in the future, I'll try to stream um, in the mornings as much as I can so you guys can join. But my schedule right now is pretty crazy. So starting with disclaimers, um, I just wanted to address a few things that I see in the comments pretty often for these like DCF videos and also just add some um, notes as well. I talk about a few notes. Um, so first is that this is just one point of reference for your own analysis and research. It's not financial advice. I'm not claiming to be the best modeler in the world or anything. I do think that the, what I do with these streams though are arguably much more than what most people do on YouTube and I hope it's helpful for you as you either are doing this for your own educational purposes or if you're an investor. And so yeah, if you have anything that you disagree with or see mistakes I make, I'm happy to always look at those in the comments. Um, but yeah, just think of this as just like one point of, re uh, ref one point of reference, right? And so re related to that, a real DCF would involve like a lot of time and research for every single assumption, like kind of what equity research analysts, uh, when they build the models, all the time they put in, or also like hedge fund analysts, etc. But you know, we're retail investors, you and me, most likely. Um, unless, yeah, we're retail investors and we don't have the access to a lot of the information that those other investors, like institutional investors have. And we also don't have as much time, right? We're not like investors full time. So um, that's why I do like high level street based DCFs. And that kind of leads to number three here. Like, so the DCFs I'm building, um, I, I am like personally interested, like after building a DCF, like what do the numbers show me in terms of like a street based DCF? What do I need to believe in order to buy a company or a stock at a fair price? Right. And that's where I add ranges in order to kind of see what the range is in terms of this is what the street thinks as a base case and then a conservative case, optimistic case, like what do I need to believe, right? And I think that range is a little bit helpful for me personally. And uh, the last kind of like disclaimer is that markets move fast, assumptions change overnight, so don't get married to the numbers I show. And a few other random notes. One is that um, I get this question a lot, but DCFs, the file is available for terabyte ma Patreon members. And there are DCF explanation videos in the description. There, I also did a kind of like what's happening with the markets video um, pretty recently. So that's in the description as well. I think it is very helpful to watch that one in particular because if you're not sure what inflation, interest rates, like all that stuff, like what's happening in the macro picture, macro environment is pretty much dictating everything stock related right now so, and crypto related. So I, I would recommend watching that if you're not sure about what's happening with the macro environment. And lastly, I'm going to start doing a new thing. Like I think these longer um, DCFs can be a little bit uh, intimidating maybe for some people to watch the whole thing. And so um, I'm going to have like a shorter video also going over like trading comps and then like my overview of the uh, DCF and a few other miscellaneous things. So that'll be usually one or two days after the DCF. So I'm going to try to do that for every DCF video I do. And I forgot I wanted to add one other thing is like in this agenda after building the DCF we're going to like go over the DCF plus um, price uh, plus like test out assumptions and etc. So anyway, that's what we're going to go over. Let's next go into Amazon situation overview. So I think what not a lot of people know is that Amazon actually earns most of its revenue from its, uh, sorry, I gotta find this out right here. Uh, so it earns most of its money from 
a revenue from its e-commerce and that's what I think a lot of people think they might get their profits from but actually most of their profits come from AWS which is like the cloud service so North America stands for is basically e-commerce for North America international e-commerce for um, international countries and then AWS obviously is like the cloud thing that I just mentioned but if you look here you can see that for example in 2022 um, just in the past three like quarter uh, past quarter 69 billion in sales but negative 1.568 in operating income so it's actually operating at a loss uh, at least for that quarter and then for international same thing operating at a loss for this quarter and then for AWS 18 billion so a lot less in terms of overall revenue but operating income is 6 billion and so and it's also uh, growing fairly quickly like if you look at the sales here it grew by what is like 30 40 percent while international sales here actually decreased and North American sales like barely increased so that's something important to note and in case uh, I thought this also was kind of interesting if you look at market share in the US for uh, e-commerce you can see Amazon's like a pretty big leader 41 percent but in terms of a DCF perspective you know that this the cash that Amazon cash flow that Amazon might actually earn for its e-commerce probably will be out into the future versus um, AWS which is like earning its cash earning the company cash um, more so in the present and also immediate future and in the long-term future probably looking at um, AWS actually you can also see that it owns 33 percent so it's like the leader in the space right now very good for good sign obviously for Amazon um, and yeah we can also see Amazon stock year-to-date down 35 percent which is it would make sense given the macro environment, but then if anyone were to have said back, you know, like three to six months ago, like, yeah, Amazon stock's going to be down 35% or whatever, then obviously people would not really believe that, but it's been a pretty rough year. And the other thing I actually obviously need to mention is that Amazon just had a 20 to one stock split, um, very recent, but you probably had seen like Amazon stock was before like, Two thousand something dollars, and now it's one hundred ten dollars, and it doesn't really affect anything besides the number of shares, and just psychologically for a lot of like investors, it makes it easier to buy, and that's also kind of a reason why I wanted to do Amazon right now is because it just had this stock split, and it doesn't necessarily mean you know the company's value is like valuation has changed or anything, but uh, yeah, I'm curious to know like because of this basically, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's the Amazon situation overview, very brief. Stock split happened, I think, early last week. And now I want to go into um, our sponsor for today's video, Wall Street Prep. And um, maybe most important thing is that if you are interested in this at all, as I kind of talk through it, there, I have a code, Rare Liquid, that you can use to get 20% off. And as I, yeah, as I think uh, if you are at, at all interested in like financial modeling, um, definitely use that code to get 20% off. But Wall Street Prep, as you guys may have seen from my previous videos, is a financial modeling plus a lot of other kind of courses that you can just kind of learn and teach yourself online. And I yeah, personally went through their um, courses and what I personally recommend is like their premium modeling package. And uh, they also have like a ton of other courses, right? And I think personally, if you actually go through, you know, a lot of what I do in terms of like the DCF, um, I don't go over everything, right? Like if you really want to learn how to model, there's a lot of, of other aspects to it. Like I usually just build a high level DCF, but there's also things like building out your weighted average cost of capital very specifically, three statement modeling, there's M&A modeling if you want to do that at all, trading comps, transaction comps, um, LBO modeling. A lot of these like you don't necessarily need for investing, but I assume that if you're watching this video, you may also be interested in just modeling in general. And these uh, courses basically are just super, super thorough. And you actually look at financial statements of Apple in this case, and then build out a model with um, like as the course teaches you. And so uh, that's what I liked about uh, this course is like you actually dig into the financial statements as you build the model, which is kind of what you do in banking. Um, so this premium package, I think is like the most popular It's 500, but you get 20% off if you use my code. 
Also, if you're kind of new and you're not really sure, you, you don't really know much about accounting, that's actually the fundamental part of um, financial modeling. So I would also recommend this course. And then a lot of people, you know, if you want to get better at, at Excel, then um, they also have an Excel crash course. Uh, the last thing I would mention, yeah, Wall Street Prep established 2004. They teach all of the top analysts or all of the uh, top banks and all the other institutions. And um, I actually worked with this guy who Andrew Federico, who is a guy who kind of reached out to me about Wall Street Prep and becoming like a sponsor for Rare Liquid. Um, but he worked with me at JP Morgan uh, and the healthcare group, where is that? Somewhere. Oh, yeah, here it is. JP Morgan on the healthcare investment banking team in New York City. I was in San Francisco, but that's how I got to know him. Really great guy. Um, and yeah, just I think for a former banker to be working at the company, it means that they're paying him pretty decently and they really care about talent. Um, so yeah, with that, yeah, check out Wall Street Prep if you want. With that said, let's now go into the high level DCF and then I'll kind of go over the. Um, assumptions and all that stuff later. All right, so we're gonna be starting from scratch as usual. And also a lot of you guys have asked for like a Excel modeling um, video. I am gonna to try to do that in the future. So be on the lookout for that as well. I have to put some thought into like how to, like what to really show for that course, um, or that, uh, I'm not always the best at talking while I model. Um, yeah, for the Excel thing, let me know if you guys want to see anything in particular. I have some thoughts about what to do, but yeah. Okay, anyhow, right now I'm just gonna be setting, yeah, setting things up. Um, I think a lot of you guys may have, if you have seen the other videos, seen something similar. And this will be assumptions. And then we'll have, oops, we'll have that stuff later. And then we'll have our income statement. Cash flows, items. And then um, we'll have the DCF. Cool. All right, ticker Amazon. Today's date is the 12th. Oops. some of the numbers and this also actually includes estimates as well and I also got the cash flow statement I downloaded all of this from FactSet you can also download from BAMSCC.com um, for the historicals and I would recommend checking them out I'm not there they don't sponsor me or anything but I used to use them at JPM all the time and still to this day actually Okay, so let's see how far we go back, 2013. And I am thinking today, actually, I might, I might um, do a five-year DCF. Depends on what the numbers kind of look like, but I might do a five-year DCF instead of a 10-year DCF, we'll see. Twenty twenty two is not over yet, so I'm gonna add this line over here to show kind of these are the expected numbers versus the actual. All right, we have revenue. Gonna need percent growth. EBIT. Percent of sales. percent of EBIT
I also got this new keyboard that's like ergonomical, so it's like some spread out. Getting used to it a little bit. Also, something that I want to do in the future is uh, a lot of times my models, you know, it's it's hard to make like a really good model in like one to two hours, which is how much time I usually try to spend doing these kind of like DCF videos. I think what I'm going to try to do in the future is like kind of build upon videos. Because right now, for example, I'm just looking at sales per year and then I'm just, you know, make, doing growth assumptions based on like historicals and estimates, right? But later for Amazon, for example, you know, we saw previously that there are like uh, breakdowns for the different like segments and um, they even off I, I was looking around and they even have it for break broken down into uh, like they give DNA and like capital expenditures for each of those um, different segments as well and so I may try to I'm gonna try to like beef up the, the models over time so that so basically what I'm trying to say is this probably won't be the only Amazon DCF uh, video that I make. I'm going to try to like improve the models over time. Okay, and so this, because of the, I think a lot of people will be surprised to see how big Amazon's revenue is versus like how low its actual EBIT margins are. So it's like three to five percent, right? Really, really low. For a, And it, it makes sense because Amazon's mostly e-commerce and like over this during the situation overview I kind of showed you guys that why um, Amazon or I showed you how Amazon most of its profits is actually coming from AWS right um, yeah it's real it's I, I find that pretty interesting Because Amazon's obviously one of the largest companies in the world, and then people probably, I, and I think people generally, maybe assume that Amazon is financially like one of the best on paper, and not actually. I don't actually think that Amazon is bad per se on paper. Uh, it's just a very different model than what I think most people might expect. We're going to need DNA, we're going to need CapEx, and then make this percentage sales. Um, percentage of CapEx. Then change of networking capital. this on the cash flow statement and right here oh this actually I'm gonna have to clean this up a little bit so these are on the off they, they go opposite right so uh, oh. I'm doing this right now because as you guys will see later, it'll just be easy to copy paste across from the DCF tab. Wow, uh, so this is like my first time doing the stream without uh, you know having guys on the chat and all that. And even though I would say that the chat is you know it's not like we're physically next to each other or anything, not having the stream where you guys are on actually feels a little more lonely. I don't know, it's weird. Uh, maybe it's because like the chat, there's like a little bit more interaction. But this definitely feels different. I, I definitely do want to try to um, do the streams where I can, you guys can see everything in kind of in real time. So I'll try to do that in the future as my schedule allows. All right, cash flow statement. 
purchases of property and equipment. Huh, so, oh, okay. So it looks like, ah, so interestingly, um, Amazon sells some of their property and equipment every year it seems. So the plant property and equipment, it has like a net, which is their purchases plus their, because uh, because it's like a negative number for when you spend the cash and then you add the proceeds that you get from um, the plant property and equipment. So it's a little actually different from what you normally see, which is just only purchases of plant property and equipment. So just wanted to note that. I think um, it is good to use this net number. And just like a preference thing I have, I like to have like the parentheses when the numbers are negative. Networking capital we have over here changes in operating assets and liabilities. We need the year over here too. Also, um, actually, don't ever use glasses. I just started using these like um, these blue light things, so it's, I'm taking some time to get used to as well. I think um, so far, I think they help, but I'm not really sure. If you guys actually know, then I'd be very curious to know. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm gonna make these actually negative. Because I like I pre, it's it's a really a preference thing. Like, do you want to have all your expenses and costs negative, or do you want to have them um, as positive figures? And for me, I want to keep them all um, positive. So let me check this though. Yeah. Um, I mean positive when it's like a something being spent. You're changing networking capital here when it's positive, it's actually a cash inflow and these are cash outflows. So we'll kind of adjust those or use those later. And there, like I have mentioned in previous streams, there are different ways to uh, calculate your or project your DNA. It can either be as a percentage of sales or percentage of capex. So usually it's just good to kind of like look at, um, at each and then see what is like kind of more consistent and can give you a better estimate. By the way, if you guys are curious about my like kind of MBA experience so far, I do, I did start, or I have another channel called Rare Liquid Careers. And in that channel, um, I kind of go over my MBA experience my first week and I'll be like having a lot of, uh, I'll be making more videos on that channel about my experience. So if you're curious, feel free to check it out. It's just Relic of Careers on YouTube. Okay, um, also let me just really quick double check my mic. Oh yeah, okay, I think my mic's working. All right, so we got pretty much all the historical numbers that we need and okay so now is the part where we're gonna have to just kind of like get started with the DCF and then like build out the projections and all that stuff um, starting off we want our revenue and then our percent growth EBIT, percent margin taxes percent of EBIT Beyond. Then we'll have our DNA. Pers uh, looks like percentage of sales will be more consistent. Capex, percentage of sales, change in effort and capital. Looks like both are pretty inconsistent. 
We'll maybe start with percentage of sales and then see what we need to do there later. And then that gets us to our unlevered free cash flow. And then we'll have to get our present value of free cash flow. And then we'll do all this, we'll do all the rest later. Um, So I'm gonna um, add the years. Uh, I also forgot to color code everything actually. So I mentioned this in previous streams before, but it's always good to color code your models because if anyone ever audits it in the future or if you just look at it in the in the future and you want to know what you did, it's helpful to know, be able to see things like kind of right away. So the green at JP Morgan was when you link to other, other sheets. So like this, for example, is linked here, right? So that's why I'm making these green. And then black was for when you're calculating something on the sheet. So these are like calculations, right? And then purple was when it's linked to, to the same sheet. And obviously you can use whatever colors you want. But I'm just sticking with what I use, what I kind of know. Um, all right, so the projections. Oh, actually projections start here. So we're going to have the different cases per usual. We'll have our conservative case, oops, street case, which is our base case pretty much, and then our optimistic case. decided if we're gonna do five years or ten years kind of have to look at some of the figures but or we might do six years actually um, and the reason for that is because typically with DCF you want to do five to ten years but since we're kind of in the middle of 2022 I think it could work to just do six years and I think a lot of that will kind of actually depend on these next few minutes where we look at the revenue uh, so yeah, let's take a look at these a little bit. Um, we can see that revenue grew by around 20% and then around in 2020, it just jumped, skyrocketed to 38% because of COVID. Reduced back down to 22%. And as of now, the street thinks that it'll drop down to around 12%. And I went, I went through a previous, or the previous, earnings call transcript and a lot of the, you know, obviously there are a lot of macroeconomic issues right now, uh, especially with inflation. And so a lot of the, from what I read, it seems like a lot of the products people are buying, like typically buying on Amazon, you know, prices are up. It also, so, so then that is kind of like slowing down their revenue growth. And also just, they grew so much over the past few years. It's like a harder comparison in the past to be growing like as quickly. So that's why basically it seems like Amazon's revenue right now, um, Street is projecting it to only grow by 12%, which as you can see for Amazon is like a historic low. And then in the following years, it seems like the Street actually thinks that uh, it will increase in 2023 and then kind of like slowly decline. And I think based on like what I see here, first of all, these figures from 2024 onwards are not really reliable based from the street. So we're gonna come up with our own. And the reason for that is because if you go uh, for onto tax set, 
you can see you can see that you have a ton of estimates this is what the street thinks that Amazon's revenue will be in debt by the end of 2022 and usually as you can see like these numbers are not very far off from each other and that's because whilst uh, as equity research analysts who create these numbers and estimates they are constantly talking with management they're working on their models like all the time so not a lot of variety and then you also see like a lot of those same like estimates and stuff in 2023 and then you see a bunch of people fall off in 2024 and 2025 because they just don't project out that much so it's not a good apples to apples comparison to do like 2020 use 2024 onwards um, but still like somewhat useful to have uh, as a as a point of reference um, but I think what we'll do is uh, let me think here I'm or what I'm thinking about right now is whether or not we should just do like a five-year DCF or a 10-year and I let's see oh also what's important is like the margins on five percent these are not very reliable Hmm. Interesting. I'll just fix one thing. It's very interesting to me that the street, even though these numbers are not very reliable, that the margins are increasing so much. Um, I have a feeling that some of this might be like gap versus non-gap issues. I, I don't really know why it's increasing so much. Uh, be, besides perhaps the fact that AWS might increase in um, operating margins over time and it's also growing pretty quickly. So that could be a reason, but just something for me to, for, for, that I'm thinking about. And okay, so I think because it's going to be hard to project out for 10 years based on the numbers I'm seeing here, I'm just going to do a six year DCF and that's what, we'll, that's what we'll do. Okay. So let me get everything set up here. We have our EBIT. And the EBIT and I would say the EBIT. and revenue projections are like the most important and everything else for your DCF is like fairly straightforward. So we're, oops. So we're actually only going to, um, sorry, I'm so bad at multitasking, like talking and <laughs> Streaming at the same or talk uh, talking and modeling at the same time. Not my strength. Uh, so what I'm going to do is probably only like really sense um, make assumptions for our income statement items, and then for our DNA capex all that stuff. I'm not sure yet if we're going to um, build out different cases for those. in the future if, if I don't do it today it could be something I do um, in a future mo uh, Amazon modeling video all right so first things first 2022 uh, I'm going to uh, let's hide these for now yeah I'm usually I'm not as zoomed in um, when I like usually use my computer, but because I'm streaming, I want to like zoom in as much as possible. So I don't have, I have to like kind of scroll up and down quite a bit. Um, all right, so anyway, we're, we're gonna start building out our assumptions. Okay, so let's see here. 
I'm gonna actually copy copy paste from my previous like Google DCF just to save some time because this part I think is like kind of self-explanatory and I'll go through each part. But no oh crap. Alright, so basically what we have here are different switches and uh, we'll, we'll, I'll show you what, what these like basically do later if this is your first time looking at all this with me. And uh, valuation assumptions we'll also go through later, conservative case, base case, optimistic case, I'll also explain that. Um, yeah, this all makes sense pretty soon. but. I, uh, what we're going to do is for our street case, just kind of go with whatever we have in 2022 and 2023. So if we go up here, you can see that, oh, oops. Uh, I think I accidentally deleted stuff when I was copy pasting. As we can see here from uh, 2022, they, the street estimates around 12%, right? I think that might be end up being a little bit low, but we'll have that in our street case to start off. And then what I'm doing right now is making sure all the formatting is consistent, alt EST. All right, so that is up from up there. And then we'll also use the same thing for 2023. Um, and then, so it's growing to 17% or so based on what the street thinks. And then going down to 15, 12, 11, then up 13. So this is where like an example of like, does the street actually think that revenue growth is gonna decline and then increase again? Like, no, I don't think so. This is just because there are less brokers actually projecting out for the future years versus like the more recent, um, more close by years, I guess, is the way to put it. So, okay, 17%, 15%, 12%, 11%. .11%. Okay, so if it's increasing by 16%, this is where we're gonna have to kind of just I probably probably like linearly decrease over time. So obviously Amazon has not really seen a year where they have inc increased their revenue by less than 20%. But as your revenue really like increases, it gets harder and harder for your revenue to actually kind of grow faster, right? So let's see what they have in 2024, like 15.5%. 15 15 so we can assume that roughly the street thinks that like, the street uh, or Amazon's revenue is gonna be coming down slowly. And I think with DCFs, you do kind of wanna be more on the conservative case. And so I do think that this is relatively reasonable for it to kind of decrease a bit over time. And as we can see here, the decrease is around 1.4%. I did, you know, obviously this is not super, super reliable, but I think on a conservative basis, given that revenue has never, growth has never been below like, you know, 20% or so, and who knows what will really happen in the future. I think personally seeing this decline by about like 1%, 1 point, 1.25%, because this was like, oops, 
this is 1.4%, right? If it was increasing by about like 1.25% each year, I think that would kind of make sense to me. Um, so let's kind of like build that out. And this is where obviously like, if you wanted to build a proper model, you want to, you want to have like a lot of uh, resources and research that like backs each assumption. We're kind of just basing it off the street based on off what we see kind of here, right? Like decreased by 1.4%, decreased by 3.5%, this decreased by 0.6%. These numbers aren't super reliable, but it does give us like a general idea as to uh, what we want to add in our assumptions in order to build like a conservative-ish model to see um, what we need to believe for us to invest into Amazon. So in the base case, uh, I'm going to call this like revenue step. I'm going to decrease revenue by 1.25% each, each year. And actually, mm, well, let me just build this out first. So this is basically what it looks like. And I think this is like relatively, relatively reasonable. This is a tough year because of macro stuff. This is us just taking from the street. So these are purple. These are, you know, a little bit of us kind of just looking at what the street provides. I think that it's given that, you know, Amazon has a strong history of outperforming, at least in terms of revenue, or performing pretty strongly. I, I don't think these are overly conservative or optimistic, this decrease by 1.25% a year, because who knows, like maybe we'll enter into another pandemic one in one of these years and then see another like huge increase in revenue, right? Or, and that could be offset by like another year where we have like a recession. So that's where, you know, these numbers are never perfect and they're never gonna be exactly what, what ends up happening, but it covers, um, like over time, I think it will average around to something like this. Or I think it's reasonable that it could. And uh, for our conservative case, um, I think what we would want to do is just kind of, given that right now, this 11.8% is growth rate that analysts are expecting is based off of like seeing, they've already seen half the year of 2020, and they only really need to project out another six months. So they're not going to be incredibly incorrect about this assumption. It's only going to be off by a little bit. So what I want to do here is just decrease by 0.5%. And then on the optimistic on the optimistic case, we'll increase by 0.5%. Because it could work either way. You know, you're never really sure what will happen. Could go higher, could go lower. And then for Let's just call this actually, yeah. So then um, I'm gonna add revenue 2023. And for 2023, this is where, you know, who knows what'll happen. We could enter into a recession or we could have a strong rebound for whatever reason, right? And 2022, I think it's gonna be a tough year for a lot of companies. 2023 to 2024, I'm a little bit optimistic that things will, at least in the first, uh, second half of 2023, like pick things, pick, pick up again, if we do enter a recession. So in our conservative case, I think we could decrease this uh, street-based assumption. Um, let's see what we want. Let's think. Maybe decrease it by 1.5%. And then in an optimistic scenario, increase it by 1.5%. Right. And and again, this is you know really just taking off or using using like our street figures, and then we're getting to ranges, and then we'll see what like all the prices spit out, and um, kind of like get to our valuation from there. But I don't think that it's unreasonable to say, to think that, oh, Amazon could reach a 15% if the macro environment looks bad, or in like a good case scenario, 18.4%. I would even say that could be a little bit on the conservative side to have like an optimistic case like this because of Amazon's like performance in the past. 
But as I also discussed, revenue as it gets bigger, it gets harder to grow quickly, right? Um, and then for these remaining years, I think we can just do something similar. Wait, what do I do here? Um, I'm just going to call this a revenue step. And I'm going to make it negative 1.5% here and then positive 1.5% here. And that's how we're going to just do it for all of the, all of the years. So again, this is based on, on the street. Cool. So now we have our revenue assumptions and let's now create the switch. So up here we'll have one. Let me actually change this. Okay, so we're going to use our offset formula. So it referenced the cell that we're in. That's connected to the, um, the switch at zero for the columns because we don't need that. And then now our model is dynamic. So what this does, if you haven't seen this before, if I change it to two or three, one for a conservative case, two for base case, street case, and then three for optimistic case, it'll if once we connect it here, then we have our um, revenue, basically. Okay. Even margins are going to be a little bit more challenging and the reason is because well I'll, I'll talk to you guys through it so um, as we saw up here the street oops, the street believes that 2022 is going to be another down year um, and a big reason for this is because of what's happening with the macro environment but then analysts are thinking that it'll like increase over time and again like these future years are not very indicative of what might happen but because it's not like a good comparison but it at least pro provides like rough general guide right and it's increasing over time but i actually pulled up some equity research reports earlier and i was looking through them in preparation for this this model and I want to see if there are any estimates we can look for any like one particular broker. Uh, cool, it looks like they have in here. And then, so then we can kind of see what, what their margins look like over time. So I'm gonna like copy these numbers in. So maybe I should do, just do this in a separate spot so it's a little bit easier. So this is revenue, and this is EBIT, and then we can get our margin. This was 524, 18, this was 2022, and this is okay. interesting. So yeah, the reason I wanted to do this is because, you know, as we looked at 
when we look at these EBIT figures and in the years of 2024, 2025, 2026, 2027, 2024 here is 6%, but here is 8.2%, right? And that's in my head, most likely because as I mentioned, these future years are not super reliable. And if you look at Amazon's history in the past, the company has not been able to really get beyond like 6%, right? And the tricky thing about this is that AWS is going to continue to grow and contribute to EBIT. So I want to try to actually find, look through one more equity research report. See if I can, uh, I don't remember if I like for sure saw something that would be helpful, but let's take a look together. Might have seen it in this one. This is Cowan. That's revenue mix. Okay, this is good. Cool, so it does have operating income and then also revenue. So this is perfect. 2022 onwards. forget how to do this. Oh, cool, they worked. Oh yeah, so basically, I, there's this thing where you don't have to like copy paste if you use that, that thing I just did. All right, so EBIT, uh, and it just, you know, obviously saves time because then a little bit more efficient. Also, 2022. Okay, so interestingly, Cowan, oops, Cowan is a lot more optimistic. So they're, whoa, they think. Okay, so they, for one, they think revenue is going to be higher than what Morgan Stanley does. So this is Morgan Stanley. This is Cowan. So margins for, EBIT margins for Cowan go from 4.4% to 6.8%, 9.1%, 11%, 13%, 15%. It's pretty high uh, in comparison to Morgan Stanley, which is like 3.6%, 5%, 6%. Um, let me see if there's any interesting info we can get from all this. And I think what might also be helpful is to compare their target prices. So this was obviously before the stock price, uh, the, the stock split. And it looks like, yeah, they think Amazon will like 2x. So Cowan is very bullish on on Amazon. And this is also Gap. So it's not even like they're adjusting for anything. It's actually very peculiar to see, maybe it'll be interesting to also see Credit Suisse, around 3,700. Um, so, okay, also seems like for Credit Suisse, 2023 and 2024, EBIT margins, they say 7.8%, 10.8%, right? And so it seems like Morgan Stanley is actually the odd one out. So then the question is really how to grow, hmm, how to grow the EBIT margins. So let me also just, I think what we're gonna have to do is maybe, uh, okay, well, let me think about it a little bit. So let's compare. 
So it looks like the averages that we have for the street are a little bit conservative compared to Cowan. Then for Credit Suisse, EBIT margin 7.8%, 2023, and 10.8%. So 7.8% here, 10.8% here, which is obviously very high in comparison. Okay, so it looks like yeah, Morgan Stanley super conservative, Cowan super optimistic, overall street numbers that we see here, pretty kind of like base case almost. So it could it could almost make sense to just use something like Cowan for the optimistic, something like the street for the base case, and then something like Morgan Stanley and grow it a little bit for the optimistic or for the conservative case. And um, yeah, CS we can kind of just ignore. So I'm not, we may do something similar to that. Let's just like move this down here. So this is for our EBIT. Okay. And the reason that it would, you know, obviously like in a great scenario, in a, in a perfect scenario and world, I would just be able to have so much information and like done a lot of research and talk with management at Amazon to kind of have my own sense of what margins could be. But we're basically using what the street believes will happen as like our for our own analysis, right? And so that's where I think even if even if like it's, I'm not coming up with the numbers myself per se, we're we're gonna have a range and that will in itself will be helpful. And we're kind of trusting that these broker or these analysts analysts who have spent so much time with the um, with the with management and all that will be able to like come up with something that is uh, accurate. So I'm thinking right now what we might want to do is since we have these three brokers, oh wait, this is three. Um, so wait, we looked at Cowan, Bank of America, it's actually not related to Amazon, Morgan Stanley. This credit Swiss. Okay, Credit Suisse, EBIT margins here, 2.2%, well, it's very low, 7.8% and 10.8%. So we can see here that the, the street is pretty conflicted. percent, seven point eight percent, ten point eight percent. Hmm. Well, first let me just take a look and see what the average is. Basically thinking in my head right now, should we use this or this? And these numbers are like pretty similar, right? For our base case. Um, and Cowan is like a bit optimistic. And so I'm, even though these numbers are not perfect, like, uh, so actually let's look at what these numbers, who they're coming from.
Yeah, so you can see they drop down pretty significantly over time. Um, D876. Up to 2024 and then 2025 and 67 it drops off quite significantly so I think at most we probably want to kind of rely on 2024 um, and then these future years we probably just want to grow it out a bit but I think what gives me a little bit of reassurance is that in general when I looked at this I was like really unsure as to if it was like a reasonable to, for it to grow like this but seeing as how at least one company one analyst is projecting it out this way, I think it is um, reasonable uh, for us to kind of, or it, it's not like super, super off. It's not just like one analyst out of like 50 that just has like crazy numbers. Right? Right. I don't think that's the case. So, all right, thinking in my head what to do here. Uh, Okay, so I think since these are from a lot of different brokers, I'm comfortable for our base case taking from 2022 to 2024 from our uh, analysts. So we're going to copy these here. And then, then we have 2025 to 2027 left, right? And that is where we have like these figures here. It seems like Cowan is thinking it grows around like 2% a year. And then the street roughly around like one to 2% also like 3% jump here. So, and if we look at these figures here, you can see around 2%. And I think what this is really probably coming from is uh, Amazon's AWS. Uh, let me pull up. Let's go here. So segment. Um, okay, okay, let's see. Yeah. Okay, AWS. Operating income went from 9 billion to 13 billion to 18 billion. Hmm. I'm trying to think in my head right now, like a good way to kind of roughly estimate what operating income might increase by over time for AWS. Because as we discussed here, like, uh, oh, actually North America operating income is, oh, it's somewhat significant, but it kind of stalls. So actually, if I can, oh, I don't have this. You can do some like rough calculations. Yeah, I'm spending a lot of time on this because this is like pretty important. Um, the rest of the DCF is like pretty simple, I think. Let's see. Uh, all right, so North America was that one six nine three twenty twenty seven seventeen nine two four, and then AWS goes from nine two zero one. 9 for 2021 cool perfect it matches um, and then what I wanted to do is actually look at the growth rates for AWS all right so yeah that's that that makes sense for it to kind of decrease because it's a larger base to kind of grow from 
So let's say, you know, this decreases by 10%. Um, let's say this grows, this is super rough calculations, obviously, but let's say this grows by 30%, then like 20. Let's just have it decrease by 8% um, in the next few years. And this was like roughly staying flat. Like, I'm just gonna super. these numbers can change a lot but it's more of AWS that I'm trying to see like what its impact is going to be in 2022 onwards and again super rough calculation so let's say this is our operating income our revenue 2020 2019 margin we calculate it here okay very interesting so it, even if our okay so even if this decreases by let's say six percent so even if this is growing Even if the growth only decreases by 6%, looks like our margin is around 6%, 6 um, because our revenue is increasing by so much. So that's super interesting. I wonder how these guys are getting their figures. Hmm. Uh, I mean, for me, for it to stay around 6%, Kind of makes sense. I think maybe what this is also missing is just the fact that like these obviously could increase by a lot over time, and I don't have a lot of like good ways to predict how these operating incomes will change over time. So I that is has to be in my head like what's what the main difference is here. So from 2022 to 24 and 24, basically for me, it makes sense for margins to be around like six to a little bit higher. Um, actually, yeah, but it really just depends on uh, North America and international, like the e-commerce, like how profitable can they make that part of their business. And based on the numbers I see here, my assumption is that one Cowan in particular, and maybe all the other company, all the other analysts, maybe, maybe they're still like super optimistic or trying to justify their previous price targets when everything was hot. It's either that, or and they're being overly optimistic, or it's just that the e-commerce side is actually going to start to be a lot more profitable, right? So my takeaway here is that I'm going to assume that I don't. You know, because I haven't done as much research as these, as these equity research analysts, I'm going to kind of take their word for it a little bit, but I'm going to be a little bit more conservative than them. And that I think will be like a good happy medium in a sense. And so let's see. Um, this goes 8.2%, 3.6, 5.7. So these two numbers are going to be probably pretty accurate. And then I think from 22, 2024 onwards, that's where we can kind of grow it by a, a little bit and that's what I'm going to do but I'm going to be a little bit more conservative than what the street is currently currently projecting so we're going to have an EBIT step oh, for a quick second I thought I, I, I thought uh, sorry, I thought I didn't turn on the streaming thing and I wasn't uh, 
recording this. Ooh, slightly bad. Okay, so EBIT step here, I'm gonna grow it. Uh, let's see what 1.25% looks like. Okay, by 2027, 10.7%. Uh, by 2024, 7%. So street, Morgan Stanley thing 6%, Cowan 9.1%, Credit Suisse 10.8%, street overall 8.2%. So 7% by 2024 looks like might be a little bit too low. Let's try 1.5. So also something we have to keep in mind is that EBIT for this company has been around five to six percent for so long, right? So I think this would be a huge success if Amazon was able to get to eleven point seven percent. I know the street here thinks you know they're pretty optimistic, as we discussed, but to build a more conservative model, I think I'm going to go with this these smaller figures and. Let me know in the comments actually if you think I'm missing something, and then if and I'll, in that in the next Amazon kind of DCF I do, I'll try to do some more research into the EBIT and try to come up with like a, a more accurate number if needed. Um, for EBIT step, um, so I'm gonna write here that it's 23 onwards. And we're gonna to need to do the same thing here. Okay, conservative case. EBIT, um, I don't know if it'll really go a lot lower than 3.6%. Uh, Let's make this decrease by 0.5% and also have this increase by do this from 2022 to 2020 uh, so let's have EBIT step I don't know what's called step right uh, actually maybe it's called step because it's like you like step on stairs it's just something I, I used to use the terminology I used to use in banking when you have like a, a, a specific amount that you increase as a step in a sense um, so let's let's call this 0.5 percent and same thing here You know, I have a feeling already as I'm building this out that we may get to we may get to a num uh, share price that is pretty much like a, a bit lower, maybe a lot lower than what the current share price is. Like I get a feeling that that's what might end up happening based on this even margin, because this is such a huge um, assumption. In an hour and 15 minutes. I'm gonna to try to keep this under two hours, at the longest. Okay. And then for our conservative case, I want to have like a pretty conservative one because as we kind of went through, you know, the e commerce segment is not super profitable. So I want to keep this decreasing by 1%. And then, you know, we also have that super optimistic case where things are, let's see, 2024, they're projecting like, you know, 9%, 10%, 8%, so around 8% in 2024. So then we can yeah, increase this by 1%. I think it would actually also make it might even make sense to grow it by like one point something percent, but let's just do this for now. Okay. 
that this will be very interesting to see. Um, sorry, it'll be very interesting to see how our how our valuation changes based on based on this. Taxes. Um, we all actually need to really sensitize this. I like. Um, I mean, tax rate, corporate tax rate right now, I believe is. Uh, I always forget. Either nineteen or twenty-one percent. Twenty-one percent. Okay. But Amazon is doing something to decrease their taxes like a little bit. Uh, let's see what their history looks like. So yeah, it's really high. And lower, so it doesn't look like they ever ever actually pay that like twenty one percent. I think maybe we can keep. Uh, I think twenty one percent is reasonable uh, for just like the base case. Mm. Make it something like 19, or maybe like let's say government changes and they increase it to 25%, and then let's say Amazon's able to keep it around their previous year of 19%. I'm um, not going to worry about this too much, shouldn't affect their analysis by a lot. So, oops, base case. So obviously, when's, our, when's the next election? The next election is when things will change, right? Next presidential, 2024, yeah. So things are not gonna change until later, so. I mean, actually 21% 20, given like, Amazon is not always paying that 21%. It's actually a little bit incorrect to have it at 21%. I'm gonna just call it 19%. And then here, I don't know if the president would ever lower it, but in an optimistic scenario, let's, or maybe even like Amazon is able to just like do whatever it needs to do to lower its tax um, taxes, right? And then um, let's keep this up. Let's make this 15%. Okay, so then, Next four years, things will probably around probably be around 19%, and then in the conservative case, where taxes increase, let's make it 25%. And then an optimistic scenario, let's say that Amazon is able to do what a lot of companies do, and just they're able to keep the taxes low. So yeah, obviously I forgot to I forgot to also mention that this is not a the actual tax rate tax rate, which is probably why we're not seeing like something closer to maybe 21 percent. And uh, we're doing this as a percentage of EBIT because of the unlevered cash flow formula. So that's also something that might be important to take into consideration. So EBIT is your EBIT minus your taxes. DNA, let's now pick up from our cash flow items. Uh, we don't have our projections. I need to get these. OK, 
Okay, well, let's first see if we can actually project them. If not, then I might uh, see what analysts are projecting. So DNA here. actually looks wrong. This should be this divided by our sales number. So I do know that Amazon is spending quite a bit on its capital expenditures over the next few years to build up both AWS and its retail. So that's why we actually see these big increases. Um, and that's what actually will make projecting out capital expenditures and DNA a little bit tough. So I think what I will have to do is look into analyst projections. So I'm probably going to have to pull those. Um, so let me grab the formula that I've used. So I, I pulled this from a previous DCF I built just to save some time. And let's project out, see what it all looks like. Oh no. Oh, okay. I thought computer was gonna freeze. And I didn't save anything. <laughs> okay. Um, and then we need capital expenditures. Pull the formula again. So it looks like the street thinks that it'll increase by, it'll stay around 60 billion. So it'll go and then kind of like plateau. And let's again, look what other, let's look in more into detail. So CapEx 57, 57, 58, 2024, 58. Okay, so street is a little bit higher than, who is this, Credit Suisse and this is Cowan. Their capex goes from 50, 41, 42. Interesting. So they have capex decreasing quite a lot over time. Or it doesn't. It doesn't grow. They're only growing by one percent each year. So that's pretty. Huh. Why is Cowan doing it like that? It's, it feels like Cowan is very, very optimistic. Um, let's look a, a little bit deeper into each of the brokers. 
So yeah, Cowan, Cowan is an anomaly. Some of these numbers are pretty high. Um, I think I feel comfortable keeping it around 60 billion and then growing it by a little bit over time. And this is actually a pretty significant, it's gonna be, because the number is so high, it's gonna be pretty important actually to get these like numbers as correct as possible. Because we can already see here that our EBIT is around 15 billion. So if we are a huge negative, like these first few years are not gonna even have like produce much positive free cash flow at all. That might actually be an issue with just Amazon in general. Like your maybe DCF is not necessarily the best way to value the company because it's still a relatively um, high-ish growth company for its size and it has like AWS and stuff like that. But anyway, okay, so um, hmm. Trying to think about what to do here. What would this do? I'm gonna just try first to see if like a, a shortcut works, but if if it looks too crazy, then I'm gonna have to like build something else out instead. This gets like way too high in the later years. Hmm. Kind of do like how this is like growing in in the up until like twenty twenty four, and then it gets like too high over here. So let's see what the street thinks again. So the street basically thinks that in order for Amazon to maintain its business and growth, it needs to invest something around 60 to $70 billion every year. Um, it's pretty high. Okay. Well, I guess it is what it is. Um, Actually, so what I'm thinking right now is maybe just going with these numbers and maybe in the future, in the future, my next DCF thing, I will um, I'll change these a little bit. But the reason that I kind of, I'm okay with these numbers is like one, like I, I'm not like making them up myself. And then also the decline that in percentage of revenue, like for me makes sense. Like over time, Amazon should already kind of have its business all set up and it should not have to keep pumping in more and more money into as a percentage of revenue. Like CapEx should not be continually increasing over time and should be decreasing as Amazon has everything set up. So yeah, and as we can see in the past, like Amazon is just recently started maybe like putting a lot more into fulfillment centers and such, but over the past 10 years, it has not really gone above, you know, five, five ish percent. So I think this is actually maybe even like overly conservative to have it at these numbers. And I think, but yeah, but anyway, we'll try to go with those numbers for now. And then we should imply that we should probably use our DNA numbers here as well. Yeah, this is a big shortcut. Um, I have a feeling that this, our, yeah, our, as I mentioned earlier, our share price for, hmm, yeah, share price for Amazon might be really low. And uh, we'll see. All right, the change in networking capital as well. I'm just gonna use, well, let's see what it used to look like in the past. Yeah, really small percentage. Um, 
1% at max. So I think, or 1% 1, 1 seems to be the average. So I'm just gonna use an average here as well. over the past three years. Negative 0.5% looks like it's not too crazy. Like over the past, uh, from 2020, what is this, like 19, 17 to 2019, it, it was like negative. But this is also such a small number that shouldn't make a huge difference. The big concerning thing is more of like the, the capex, in my opinion. Um, but we'll see what the numbers come out to. Okay, so then we have our EDOT plus our DNA minus our capex, minus our change in network and capital. Yeah, so we actually even have negative free cash flow in our first year, which will actually make a pretty big difference to our model. Okay, so DNA, capex, we are not going to sensitize for, at least for today's model, we may so do so in the future. And then for our WAC, I found from Cowan, I think, Earlier when I was looking at it, they use a 10.5%. And this is pretty recent, right? May 26, 2022. So I'm gonna use that as like our base case. And then in our optimistic case, I'm gonna decrease it by 1%. And then in our uh, conservative case, increase it by 1%. And I think 11.5% whack would just be way, it's pretty aggressively high. Or uh, yeah, it's, it's very, very conservative, I think for Amazon, one of the largest companies in the world. I'm gonna growth rate, 2.5%, very standard, conservative case, 2%, optimistic case, 3%. I'm actually most likely gonna use this optimistic case of 3%, given Amazon, I think we're able to continue to grow by around 3% over time. And we'll use a choose function for our whack. And then, oops. Cool. And then we'll, we're gonna call this our whack and call this TGR. And I'll show you what that does in a bit, pretty soon. Okay, so we got pretty much all our numbers. We're very, very close to um, our figures here. So what I'm gonna do is actually, let me think. Um, so we're in 2022 right now, right? Uh, and half the year has gone by. So I want to actually just take half of this in a sense, because right now it's June 12. <clears throat> so uh, June, um, essentially what we're going to need to do. Okay, this is a big shortcut, but since June is so close to just half the year being done, I'm just gonna take basically 50% of this first year's free cash flow, right? And so this is like very um, dirty, I guess, way to do this, but uh, I think um, that just makes our model a little bit more accurate. And then I wanna use like mid-year convention. So let me remember how to do this. Uh, present value. So, Unlever free cash flow and then time period should be like 0 0.5. 
this is this one. So what this is gonna do is gonna take when we Alright, let me think. Let me think for a bit. Um make sure I can do this correctly. Yeah, okay. So because we're in about half the year, normally when you do things to present value, if you I think it'll be show, easier if I show you guys. So this is like a little bit of a sh shortcut of like what I did because we're in, we happen to be in June. And so what this will do is just take, uh, so when we do our free cash flow times one plus, or sorry, discount back five by one plus your whack to the power of the year that you're in. in my head. Hmm. Okay, 6, 12. All right, the more act, okay, I'm gonna try to show you guys the most accurate way possible. Um, so 6, 12, so 12, 23, oh, 1231, 22 minus, I don't know if this is going to work. Okay, so 202 days have passed out of 365. So what I want to do here, I forget exactly how to like call, all, like label all these things, but I'm going to have like, this is for this is in reference just for 2022. So 200, 202 days have passed out of 365. All right, so well, basically what I'm trying to just say here is that there are there's 45% of the year left, right? So in this first year, we're gonna actually just only take, um, 45% of this year's free cash flow. that kind of made sense I know uh, I didn't explain that super well but uh, we're just taking the amount of cash flow left in the year for this year 2022 because six months has already passed right well oops actually I did this wrong it should be 365 minus 202 is how many days are left There are 202, <clears throat> there are 202 days left in the year. So it's actually 202 divided by 365. 55% of the year is left, right? And so this is basically saying, okay, let's get our half the year of cash flow and then discount it by 0 0.5, 0 0.5 years instead of like one full year because it's not going to... Uh, it, well, this is more like mid-year convention, but it's basically for the remaining six months of the or remaining time for 2022. Uh, let's dis let's get our cash within half of the full year, ha half of the amount of time left, instead of um, having it be like one full year, basically. And this is kind of like a complicated thing to explain if you have like studied finance and you know what I'm talking about. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of leave it at that. 
Uh, okay, and then for these, what we'll need to do is just is divided by one plus our whack to the power of the year we're in. Concerned because these numbers are very low. All right, but let's see what all right, we have our terminal value, present value of terminal value. So then we get our unlevered free cash flow. Times one plus our terminal growth rate divided by our WAC minus our terminal growth rate. Is high, uh, and then we divide by one plus our whack, the power last year we're in. Okay, starting to feel better about this, and then now we get to our enterprise value that equals your sum that and that. And then we have to add our cash. Subtract our debt. Let's pull these numbers from the latest quarterly earnings report. We're here at the balance sheet, cash, March 31st, 2022, 36 billion plus 30 billion here. And then we have our debt which is just long-term debt looks like. Yeah, nothing else. But basically they're cash and debt. Um, actually no, they have some more cash than debt. All right, cool. So then now we're at our equity value. So enterprise value plus our cash minus our debt. And then we need to get our shares, and then this gets us to the share price. Shares, fully deleted shares, we're just gonna, you know, it's obviously always better to calculate it yourself, but we're gonna take a shortcut here. Shouldn't change our analysis too much. Basically though, this is not the final thing of what I, you know, what I'm saying that Amazon is, their, their share price is, but as of our current assumptions, we're getting to $88.10, which as I kind of had mentioned through, as I was building all of this, that we might get to a pretty low number. But again, we're gonna change some of like our switches here based on like what I personally think makes sense. So there we got our share price, and then uh, for reference, we'll have our current share price. Um, okay, so, oops, implied share price. Only. And as of today, which is Sunday, June 12th, Amazon stock is at 109.65. And this like different um, thing or what do you call this? Game or inside, upside, downside.
All right, so we built out the model. Now it's a matter of like, what do you actually believe? And um, so yeah, this is the part where I go through the model before I go through like what I actually think makes sense. I wanted to give a friendly reminder about our sponsor, Wall Street Prep. They're the company that um, trains a lot of analysts at a lot of the top banks and schools and institutions in the world. You can see like 200 corporate clients, 125 universities, hundreds of thousands of people and customers. And what I personally would recommend, if you remember from the beginning of the stream, is their premium package. And it's for $500, but if you use my code Rare Liquid 20, or Rare Liquid, you get 20% off. So it'll actually make it Four, wait, twenty percent off, ten percent, four hundred dollars, I think. And um, yeah, if you use this course, you, it it'll be very helpful for like financial statement modeling, DCF modeling, M and A modeling, trading comps, transaction comps, LBO, basically everything that I learned when I was like at JP Morgan. And if you haven't actually learned about accounting yet, that is like the basis for modeling. So I would also recommend if you're kind of new to like brush up on accounting. And then there's also like Excel stuff if you are interested in Excel stuff. So yeah, friendly reminder about Wall Street Prep. Um, there's a link to it down in my description and yeah, make sure you use the code 20 Rare Liquid to get 20% off. All right, with that said, let's go back into what we believe. So, okay, now I need to, now I'm gonna just kind of go through and because like this is our, this, I had the feeling that we were gonna get to something very conservative um, let's see like if everything were optimistic, All right? We get to 134. It's actually not even like that much more than what Amazon is currently at. Um, in super conservative case, we have like 57, All right? Um, okay. And so starting off with our revenue switch, right? What do we think, uh, will happen here? So... 11, 12 percent, 18, 17, 15, 16. I think we can make an argument either way, like street case being correct, like this one or this one. Um, I, think, I think that really depends on what you believe. I think for revenue, I will go with the uh, street case to be a little bit more on the conservative side. And then for our EBIT, you remember this was like a huge driver of our model. And I think we kind of, I think what would make sense is choosing one of these to be cons like a street case and one of these to kind of be more on the optimistic side. Like I think the conservative we have here just to, you know, worst case scenario, let's see what will happen. But I think personally, um, 6.2, 8.2, 9.7, 12.7, this is back in, this is in 2027. Uh, compared to like Cowan, who thinks it's 15.4%, one could argue that our model for EBIT is just generally very, very conservative. Oops, I meant, to, I meant to make this nine. So I think making this our optimistic case, like is still conservative compared to a lot of equity research, right? So I think making this um, three makes sense, or optimistic makes sense. Taxes, we can keep at 19%. Uh, everything else is not really changeable. And then our WAC, I think keeping it at 10.5% uh, um, is fair. Terminal growth rate, I'd want to make it more optimistic. So basically what this is ba saying is that based on the model right now, current share price of $109, there's a 7% decrease. Now, I think this is very, very conservative and as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, in a future video, I'll be going over like the other ways to kind of view Amazon stock. And uh, cause you all, you don't want to only focus on one type of valuation me methodology. Right. Um, and I think what is bringing this whole analysis and like the valuation down quite a bit is that we have a very, very large increase in capital expenditures that I will have to dig into. And for my next Amazon model, kind of like create more scenarios and then um, kind of do some more research to see whether or not I believe these figures to be true. Um, because I think everything else here that we like modeled out is like kind of reasonable. Um, these figures here, I think need, need to do some work like these. I'm not too worried about. 
So that's what I would kind of do. But essentially also what this means is that let's say the macro environment causes Amazon stock to go down further. And let's say it goes to like 100 bucks or like 80 bucks, something like that. I would be comfortable at this point if Amazon fell to something like in the 90s or 80s because Amazon has never been one of those like huge cash flow generating companies and it's something you want to more invest kind of in the long run um, because they're always investing into their business and so their cash flow is never like super high. If you're a believer in Amazon, like I think even now in this current price, like Amazon is not trading at an insane uh, valuation. I think like the what, the what what is that right now is relatively fair. I would I would guess that if the if there's a recession or the macro environment um, gets increasingly worse, inflation gets worse, and interest rates go up, then I would I would not be surprised at all for Amazon to see a fall into the 90s, 80s. Um, so and if it does, you know I think Amazon's a buy at those prices. So. I guess in summary, right now, it seems like it's around like a pretty fair price. If it falls down further, 80s, 90s, then, you know, I think Amazon's a buy. Um, so yeah, that's what I think. That's that kind of the conclusion that I come up with based on today's work. And yeah, I hope this was interesting to all of you. Let me know in the comments if you guys have any questions. I'll try to answer as many as I can. And yeah, I hope this was interesting. Catch you guys all in the next stream. Take care. Bye.